So if you treat these infectious diseases with steroids alone, if many of us have a tendency to do that, uh, it could. Uh, it does require a high index of suspicion. And uh, the basic uh, idea is to recognize these infections as they occur in the anterior segment or in the posterior segment. Okay. And I'll be giving a little uh, glimpse of how the non infectious deviation looks in a similar kind of setting. So, first we will take uh, uh, the viral antiretrovirus, and these days we are seeing uh, many of these uh, uh, very commonly caused by uh, mostly by HSV or uh, VGV, and now more and more patients are being recognized with CMV, uh, infection of the anterior segment, particularly in immunocompetent individuals. Uh, viral infections by and large are unilateral. Uh, and uh, they are acute in onset, uh, and uh, they are usually recurrent, unlike uh, the other which could be. Now, let's take an example of this herpes uh, anterior uveitis, such as the uveitis. Uh, you know, many of us don't uh, look for, say, a corneal edema or a corneal opacity uh, and high intraocular pressure uh, in a large number of these patients. So if you see this kind of a setting, think of uh, uh, viral uveitis, okay. Compared to uh, a very classic autoimmune uveitis that we see with uh, seronegative spondyloarthropathies, where actually is an acute onset again, uh, but what you see here is a lot of flare, a lot of cells, you see a fibrin deposit, uh, you, which might uh, present as a hypopion, uh, you do not have really uh, any precipitates because there are a lot of cells on the back of the cornea and the pressure would be a little low. So this is how we will be able to uh, tell the difference between uh, a non-infectious and an infectious setting. Now, there are other clues like uh, the, these pigmented KPs uh, are very classically seen in viral uh, infectious uveitis and uh, many of these patients would have uh, posterior synecy. Now, how do we tell the difference between these kind of KPs and the kind of KPs we we'll see typically in uh, or a copy nodules or the Pasaka nodules that we'll see uh, in uh, uh, most of the uh, granulometers in VIS like uh, uh, what we see in Sarquire or, uh, you know, in uh, recurrent uh, VK disease uh, or sometimes in, even in uh, tuberculosis. So these are some of the examples that we will see in non-infectious by granulomatous uveitis, unlike what we see in uh, these kind of pigmented cases, which respond very, very quickly to uh, your treatment. And of course, uh, uh, you would see these kind of granuloma deposits in sulfur, so you don't really see these kind of deposits in infective uveitis. Uh, other clues are like the presence of these uh, focal uh, defects, so you must look for these focal iris defects when you're suspecting viral uveitis. Now going to the posterior uveitis where by and large most of the infections uh, would occur in the posterior segment. So these are, uh, I'd like to share this example of a patient, a young man who's undergone a renal transplant on immunosuppressive specific therapy comes, had chicken pox and comes within a month or so of uh, developing chicken pox uh, with this kind of setting where you can see there's a uterus haze here and there are a lot of small tiny retinitis patches and it showed within a matter of three days uh, you can see uh, peripheral confluent tongue-like lesions which are spreading posteriorly and getting circum uh, essentially uh, confluent. So this is a very, very rapidly. So infections uh, are the common theme is a rapid progression. So this is what you would see in these kind of patients. And uh, an example of a patient who's uh, HIV positive gets uh, infection like uh, heartbeat zoster. Uh, again, you would see this kind of a progressive outer retinal necrosis. Here, you don't see um, uh, any vitreous cells, but what you are seeing here is a rapid progression to blindness. Over a matter of few days, the fellow would go blind. That doesn't typically happen in immune uveitis. And other example is like here, what you are seeing in CMV retinitis, low CD4 counts. So these are very, very classic uh, presentations. This is a little slower than the 
herpes infection. So CMV retinitis is not a very rapidly progressive, but shows a relentless progression. So if the lesions keep healing and progressing towards the posterior pole. Like this is this would be the classic presentation. The lesion you can see is healing here, and there's a granular edges and spreading, say uh, ketchup and pizza pie kind of appearance here, and uh, very very uh, classic appearance of this. Now, another uh, viral infection uh, I'd like to introduce to you is uh, the measles, the aberrant measles uh, in young children uh, can cause, and we have seen some of these patients where they present as uh, uh, focal retinitis here, the full thickness of the retina is necrotic and within a matter of days, this is the next day, within three weeks, the fellow has gone blind from necrosis of posterior pole. So this is uh, one needs to recognize because this is a fatal disease. So again, the theme here is that these infections are very, very rapidly progressive. So viral infections, we have to keep it in mind all the time, both in anterior segment and in the posterior segment because they are amenable. They are very efficacious antiviral agents available uh, and we do not unnecessarily uh, make them blind. Now, another infection, which is now a parasitic infection, quite common uh, in several parts of our country, uh, which produces this at length and deform. This intense vitritis over a focal uh, necrotizing lesion, and uh, I'm sure you are all familiar with this uh, necrotizing again, a very intense retinitis lesion sitting next to a heel lesion. Uh, of a recurrent toxoplasma retinoproditis and they heal very effectively. But you must also realize that the congenital toxoplasmosis, if you have heard all our life to be congenital, is not as common as the acquired toxoplasmosis. So you could see a lesion even without a heal scar and again the uh, the uh, clue here is intensely necrotizing retinitis which might go into the choroid and they, these again they appropriately treated, the very uh, effective <coughs> therapies are available. So I'm not going to go into the detail. On the other hand, now look at this young lady who presents where this the ophthalmologist uh, treated this patient very, very aggressively on corticosteroids by all routes possible, intravitreal, posterior and tenocord, and oral corticosteroids, and the patient was not responding. In fact, the patient went on to develop such a necrotizing uh, retinitis because he could not detect this lesion when at presentation this young lady had 6-9 vision and went on to become blind. Uh, he did not look for uh, and uh, didn't realize that this focal retinitis represents the, the toxoplasma retinitis. If he had given uh, her the, the appropriate treatment, the lady would be saved vision. Now, many of these patients who have uh, uh, HIV infection or immunocompromised may have mixed infection like we realized in this particular lady. There's a necrotizing retinitis here, but uh, you know, we have to subject her to with a surgery to locate, uh, look for uh, what is causing it and we found it's both the, the VZV as well as the toxoplasma which is causing this kind of picture and she of course responded very well to the treatment. Now, if you see a patient who walks into your clinic with a hypogon and chemosis, the ray special, remember, autoimmune uveitis does not produce chemosis. So this is a sign of microbial infection caused by virulent organisms. Like in this patient, he had a, uh, 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 sorry, this patient had a uh, uh, coronal abscess. Uh, sitting right there, so I'm not showing you that. So another patient, remember that such a deposits in the vitreous overlying uh, corneoretinitis lesions uh, uh, and such a case in media. Now these kind of patients, you need to ask, have you been to a hospital? They will never give you the history of visit to a hospital or treatment. And this guy we found was very very sick only a month before, and uh, turned out that he had a candida infection. When we're dealing with patients who are at the extremes of age, remember, uveitis doesn't occur in extremes of age, like this young child with the hypopian, a lot of cell node reaction here, you know, turned out to be leukemia. And again, in an old age, 70 year old person coming with a hypopion, without history of trauma or without history of, uh, uh, you know, surgery, you know, think of uh, a systemic uh, masquerade. And here, in this particular case, turned out to be a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
So these are uh, uh, not to be confused with the the uh, anthropomides. Syphilis is making a comeback in the Western world, not so much here in India, because in India every patient takes his own treatment once exposed. But uh, uh, if you see a patient who is not responding to topical treatment, and you may just think of syphilis. Okay, rule out syphilis always. Uh, they may present as plaquar lesions, or they may present like a leopard skin lesion here uh, in a chronic posterior uveitis. Or this patient recently with who was with us, he's uh, a cop, he's HIV positive, also syphilis positive, and presented with this kind of picture with this uh, rima vasculitis. You can see some of these focal retinitis lesions, and on angiogram it's uh, seen here, and they respond very well. So syphilis is another. Curable uveitis. So, uh, you know, most of, uh, most of the infections, we can really cure the infections uh, if we can detect them in time. Uh, now, this is an example of uh, uh, TB granuloma, uh, where it's not only mere infection with the TB organism, but probably <coughs> the immune response also uh, produce very classical picture. And when you see these, uh, the uh, little bit of interretinal hemorrhage. Uh, is suggestive of uh, rap lesion or retinal angiomatous proliferation and is very, very suggestive of a TB granuloma. And these patients, they respond very well to treatment. There's a huge abscess formation, but respond. Once you recognize, they respond very well to the treatment. <laughs> or they may be associated with the vasculitis here uh, in this particular patient, and you can see how, again, uh, it responds very well. So if you see this kind of situation, you know that uh, we are dealing with probably a TB and you need to do a targeted uh, laboratory workup. On the other hand, like this patient, uh, you can uh, imagine, now this is a non-infective patient, you can see multifocal lesions just merging in the background, they are sitting in the choroid, and this is, uh, uh, there is a disc edema here. Now this is a sarcoidosis in the, in the choroid, uh, and these are uh, distinctly different from what we have seen here of the TB granulomas. When you see vasculitis and you see these choroiditis lesions, again highly suggestive of uh, uh, TB uh, <coughs> as a positive etiology. And these are all driven, as I said, by these are triggered by TB infection, but by and large, these are immune uh, response uh, by the eye. And this is the multifocal subgenoid choroiditis, very, very common uh, in our country and South Asian population. And you can see the active edges and the key. Uh, becoming confident and make the patient blind uh, if you do not recognize this entity. So what I've given you is a, just a small brief overview of the infective uveitis uh, and you need to recognize some of these patterns of present, uh, presentation to save these eyes. Thank you very much for your